people and pay respects to their ancestors who came before them. Today we are very proud to present What Are the Humanities Worth? in partnership with Griffith Review and part of our Deep in the Conversation program here at the State Library of Queensland. The Deep in the Conversation program is a series of talks, debates and conversations with leading thinkers designed to share and stimulate ideas. And I'm sure this evening's presentation will not be an exception to that. Griffith Review is an award-winning quarterly feature, the best established and emerging Australia feature, the, the best as, sorry, excuse me. Griffith Review is an award-winning quarterly fe featuring the best established and emerging Australian writers and thinkers. Each themed edition explores a pressing contemporary issue through essay, memoir, reportage and fiction, providing a bridge between the expertise of specialists and the curiosity of readers. This evening, we are pleased to present John Armstrong, a philosopher, best-selling author and senior advisor to the Vice-Chancellor at the University of Melbourne. In 1997, after completing a PhD in philosophy, John established and directed a research centre in philosophy of art at the School of Advanced Study in London and also started a business dealing in 18th and 19th century European paintings and classic Italian cars. He has served as a philosopher in residence at the Melbourne Business School and has written many articles for The Age and, Australia, and The Australian on art and culture. He is also the author of several internationally acclaimed books on art, love and beauty, including the most recently In Search of, Civili in Search of Civilization, published by Penguin in 2009. Tonight, John will draw from his latest essay in Griffith Review 31, Ways of Seeing, to explore how we can learn from literature, philosophy and the creative imagination to find new approaches to complex, urgent 21st century problems and discuss why radical reform is needed to the way humanities and social sciences are valued and advanced. Our format for this evening will see John deliver a 30-minute presentation relating to his essay, followed by an audience question time. Please be aware that we will be audio recording this evening's discussion and question time for our online webcast. If you have any concerns about this recording, please come and see me or any SLQ staff member after the presentation. So without further ado, please join me in warmly welcoming John Armstrong. I want to change the humanities because I love the humanities. The humanities need to reform themselves because the world needs them to. When did we learn that the request for reform in philosophy, history, literature, art history, when did we learn that a request for radical change in those areas was hostility, was a way, a covert way of saying you hated what they stood for? We learned it by listening to the wrong people. We listened to people who disliked imagination who were uncomfortable with the pursuit of knowledge, who feared that they would never be understood by the humanities. And they wanted to humiliate. And we learned the wrong lesson. We learned. We took the message that if you love the humanities, you should just want more of the same. You should just want to prop up the system as it is because that's what was under attack. But it's totally the wrong lesson. The humanities need to be reformed because the world needs them and they need to be changed because anyone who loves them should want them to thrive in the world as it is. Humanities, what on earth does that word mean? Basically, there are two quite different ideas in that competing 
for that word. There's a technical definition. The humanities are a group of specialized academic disciplines. Philosophy, art history, literature, history are the core, and they kind of expand and filter out maybe a bit of architecture, maybe a bit of the fine arts. But the thing there is institutions, disciplines, structures, promotions, people getting paid, articles getting published, journals, conferences. It's the name for a thing that a group of people get paid to do. It's a very different definition of the humanities as the great themes of life, the great themes of the world. What is really important and why is it important? What should one love? What are the most important, significant things to know? What can go wrong with the pursuit of knowledge? Not as abstract questions, but as things in people's lives, in our society. The humanities, in that sense, are the themes of meaning and value as they are played out in a society. Think of those two definitions, the great themes and the institutions. How well do the institutions reflect and serve the great themes? When I was writing my essay for the Griffith Review, I was very much taken with the figure of Martin Luther and the Reformation. Because Luther had a very unusual project. Luther wanted to change the great institution of his day, the Catholic Church in Europe. But he wanted to change it because he thought it wasn't doing well enough the really, really important things that it should do for the world and for people's lives. He hated its preoccupation with empty abstractions. He hated the way in which the common people were not invited into participation in its work. But he didn't do that because he thought that religion was unimportant. It was because he thought salvation mattered. It was because he cared about the great issues of people's lives that he wanted reform. And so I've, I wanted to hold on to the idea of reformation as capturing something very, very valuable for our society at the moment, which is the demand for change out of love and ambition. Speaking more personally, I got very frustrated, I suppose, as someone working in the humanities, and although my resume doesn't quite reflect this, I have spent many years um, teaching and researching in the humanities, mainly uh, at, at the University of Melbourne, but also at, at Monash. I became frustrated that what seemed to me the important things were continually getting sidelined by the people that ought to be addressing them. My key subject is um, philosophy of art. And in that, I came across a lot of people working in art history. I was driven demented by the avoidance of evaluation. Art historians would say, oh, we can't tell whether it's a good painting. I'd say, well, why not? I mean, isn't that the question that you're supposed to be asking? Why should someone love this thing? Why sh oh, no, we can't answer that. It's too subjective, it's too personal, and so on. Understandable worries, but isn't that a way of writing yourself into cultural oblivion? Well, of course, you can continue 
for a long time. But it's not going to be very good for the culture. It's not that those people won't have a place. It's that what they're doing will gradually damage the culture they live in. I became very conscious or very disturbed that the academic discourse around something that I thought so significant ran away from the questions of value. Why is this good? This came to a head at a specific moment I was in just outside Florence and Harvard University has a, an institute for the study of the Renaissance. It must be the most glamorous intellectual institution in the whole world, just about. Utterly gorgeous place, very well financed, beautiful. All the people there are as charming and sweet-natured as you can imagine. And yet, and yet, there's something grotesque about it. All these, all this ambition going into capturing more and more detail about the past, about the Renaissance, but not trying to live it now, not trying to learn anything from it now. There's a bitter irony there. The Renaissance was a time when people thought that they could learn from the past about how to be better now. They read great poets and thought, we want that too. They read the classics, the Greeks and the Romans, and thought, that's what we need. That the absolutely last thing, and this makes me so angry, that that place, that Harvard billion dollar institute would ever do, because they're so meek, because they're so pathetic, because they're so misguided, would be to say, we need to do anything of that now because they've absorbed a culture that tells them that the clever thing to do is to know more about what other people did, but nothing about what you need to do or should do or deserve to do. And that seemed to me at the pinnacle of the Western world's hopes as a desperate symptom of a misguided institution. This is not an Australian problem. It's not that there's somehow something about Australia that means the humanities are in trouble here. It's a, it's a problem of the world. It's a problem of institutions. It's a problem of high-mindedness in an age of cultural democracy. where what's needed is aspiration to speak into people's lives. But what we've got is a tradition of avoiding judgment, avoiding the great questions. When people love the humanities, this is an issue of friendship. When people... When I talk to people at, at dinner parties or... I don't get invited to enough dinner parties. I mean, I, I'm, I'm fantasizing here. When I talk to people in a cafe uh, on the bus about, about the humanities, I hear a lot of people saying, yeah, I'm so pro the humanities. I know that what they have in mind is Kenneth Clark writing about civilization and speaking uh, and making a television series. About, about what's wonderful about the Baroque buildings and, 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 and why we need to, uh, you know, why Milton's poetry is so moving and why Wordsworth still speaks to us. They're thinking, perhaps at a, at a, at a remove, of, uh, of a man called F.R. Leavis uh, in Cambridge in the 1950s and 60s who was a very, a, a trans advocate of the moral centrality of fine literature. He wanted people to read 
George Eliot and Henry James because he thought it would improve their inner lives. In more modest ways, I'm sure it's those kinds of longings that are in the background when people say, yes, the humanities, that's what we need more of. Of course, the people at the bus stop don't know that F.R. Levis is mocked in the humanities, that Kenneth Clark is regarded as some sort of effete monster, that, that these, this is not what you... If you subsidise the humanities, you're not going to get F.R. Levis and Kenneth Clark. That is not in the at all what you're going to get. You're going to get more journal articles because that's what the system is set up to do. It's not that they're bad people... So that's what the system produces. It's like that's what the machine does. You look at what goes in, what comes out. It doesn't... Kenneth Clark wasn't an output of the machine. Levis barely survived and is now hated. But that goes back to my two definitions. The great themes. The humanities are incredibly important. The humanities are loved and needed. But... That's not what the academic system has come to serve. This came to my attention in in another way when I I was working for some years uh, for Melbourne Business School. One of the big themes in business education is the need to absorb the humanities. I was amazed when, when I sat, when I realised this. Uh, at, when I first got appointed uh, to the business school, I was speaking to some of my colleagues uh, in philosophy and uh, in the humanities, and they were basically sort of thinking, "What on earth are you going there for?" I mean, this is just bizarre. Uh, it's 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 uh, uh, they're criminals, aren't they? I mean, it's just um, and, and, and things. Just get them to give us some of their money. And, and it, was, it, it was very, very strange because what I came to see was that in the business world, at least among um, adventurously minded people, of whom there are a lot, thought of um, the need for imagination, the need for, stro- for integrity, the need for the ability to understand what someone might be getting at but can't formulate, ability to resist fashion, to see past fashion, to see past the buzz of the moment and what is true, to see what's elegant or simple but accurate. These kinds of abilities seemed very desirable in the business world. And they would say isn't that what you do in the humanities? I would say, well, it's, it might be nice if we did that in the humanities, but I, I'm afraid, you know, if you're worried about, um, you know, the, 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 how the, um, uh, the 19th century appropriated Greek uh, statues in order to bolster its class system, if that's your problem, I can solve, we, the humanities will solve that one for you. That's fine, but maybe that's not your problem. Your problem might be, why can't we get more people to be both imaginative and realistic at the same time? Why can't we get more people able to have clever ideas but express them simply? Why can't we get people who are good at listening but not easily swayed by what they hear? Now, deep down, that's what Tolstoy is so brilliant at. Deep down, That's what Poussin, as a great painter, was about. Trying to discover what is true and important and good and to make it come real in people's lives. But those are... So the need for the humanities is there in the business world. But it would be no solution to say... Okay, let's just send those let's just send those business students to do the course on nineteenth century literature. Because the cultures have grown so far apart. 
it's embarrassing almost how defensive the humanities have become. Defensive, I suppose, is another way of saying slightly ashamed. I want to home in on what I see as a central confusion between intrinsic value and instrumental value. Intrinsic values got all the kind of nice sounding aura, resonance. Intrinsic value is what's good. Instrumental value must be slightly grubby. And so at various times, the humanity, and particularly recently, the humanities have tried to defend themselves by saying that they have intrinsic value. It's a very dodgy argument. Intrinsic value is very normal. It's completely widespread in the world. Something has intrinsic value because you like it and care about it for its own sake. And a great many things are valuable that way. Some people like gardening because they like the way it looks, because they think it's good, because it satisfies them. But we don't have... We don't think that means that somehow the people, you know, weeding their garden have a claim upon the subsidy of the state. When you care about intrinsic value, you're not let off the hook if you're an institution. Rather, you're set a very specific task. You have to bring other people on board. The tragedy, if that's not too strong a word, of the intrinsic value defense of the humanities has been that it runs away from precisely the issue that intrinsic value should point to. People say we're intrinsically valuable, therefore we don't need to compete. Therefore, we can retreat behind the walls. Don't judge us. Don't ask us to do anything. But really, intrinsic value points out into the world. If you love something and think it should matter to other people, then your task is to show other people why it matters, why it is genuinely good. If you love a novel by Tolstoy, you want other people to care about it too. Intrinsic value isn't an argument about building the walls, although maddeningly that's how it's been used. Intrinsic value is an argument for the mission, for the task of taking what you care about into the lives of others. The more we think the humanities are valuable for their own sake, the more we should long for them to take their place in the rough competition of the world. Instrumental value is also misunderstood. It's, nothing can be more straightforward than to say that efficiency is a good thing. Everything depends on what you're trying to be efficient about. It seems to me that this is one of the bugbears of businesses. They can get efficient, they can get clever at doing various routines, but they might be doing the wrong routines. Any instrumental value is a hope that you're doing the right thing. And no quantity of devotion to the idea of instrumentality gives you the slightest bit of guidance about what is worth doing. Instrumentality is only as good as your purpose. Of course, the humanities should seek 
instrumental vine. Because they should seek to guide people. That's something I think the humanities have run away from. I want to just sketch a little bit of history, a kind of psychobiography. In the middle of the 19th century, the idea of liberalism emerged, particularly in the work of John Stuart Mill. He was terribly concerned about living in a society with an oppressive imagined, imagined orthodoxy. There, were lots, there was a view of the world you were supposed to have. And there were a lot of social sanctions if you didn't share that view. And Mill argued beautifully and brilliantly for freedom of mind. It's a negative argument. When there is an oppressive orthodoxy, how precious that freedom to disagree is. In a, an extraordinary sentence, Mill says, we never know what the world will be like were we to win. We live, mostly in the West, we live where Mill won. There is no oppressive orthodoxy. But it seems to me that our intellectual culture is still preoccupied, I mean, in its university functions, with fighting off an enemy that's not there. It imagines that what we have to do is knock down the oppressive regime. Because actually what we need to do is put in place something lasting and good that what we have to do is struggle against the, the terrible evaluations that people are making. No, what we have to do is teach people to make good evaluations and sure there'll be a struggle about what those are. I can't remember how many conversations I've had in which people who seem to me whose role in life is to be teachers end up saying oh, but you can't say that. Who are you to say that? Who am I, in a sense, to say? Who am I to say that one thing is better than another, that one thing is worth human effort and another not, one thing deserves love, another does not? Of course those are risks. Of course you could be wrong. But if you don't take the risk, then what's the point? the humanities of stepping down from the great tasks. Just to raise a final point, and it's about money. We've got into the habit, I think, of imagining that the way to cure a problem is to put more money into it. I think about you know, a cafe that's not doing very well. Nobody really wants to come. There's a McDonald's around the corner. Everyone's going there. Um, you could say, well, let's ask, for, let's ask for more money from the state. Let's get a subsidy. Say, well, okay, that will keep the cafe going. No doubt about that. And you could keep it going forever. But it won't, have, it won't have improved. Let me give a more somber, but in other ways problematic example. Not so long ago, I was, um, I was at a, a literary conference um, which was held in an old ecclesiastical building, and a very nice building it was. But, of course... It had been built on a large scale in the 19th century because a whole lot of people believed in what it stood for. Now there wasn't any trace of what it had stood for, really. I mean, a few mementos. Why? Well, they had plenty of money. They had so much money. 
they were very, very bad at doing the essential things. They lost people's trust. They lost people's confidence. And it didn't happen overnight, but over a hundred years, they went from being a thriving institution to being some piece of real estate. That is no judgment on the worth of what they could have stood for, but it is a severe indictment of how they did it. This is my fear for the humanities. The humanities stand for, in principle, the most important things. But they can lose the trust of the world, and they are doing so every day. Anyone who's involved in the book industry knows how utterly um, precarious the idea of the educated general reader has become. Why? Is it because, is it because people won't pay $20? No, because they pay $500 for the hotel room. No, it's not that. It's because mostly, it's because mostly we've failed to educate such people. We haven't convinced enough people that these things matter. And the way around that, I don't know if it's going to cost money, but money's not the central issue. When institutions try to change for the better, they need a lot of friends. It's a mystery around the world why the humanities are the way they are. Basically, they're supported by the state and a kind of habit. They could retain their best qualities and be improved. It's, that's not an economic problem. It's a problem of ambition and will. And that needs support, that needs friendship. What I suppose I'm really trying to do is clarify what, what we as a society should want from philosophy, history, art history. Not just as passive recipients, but as active participants in the great themes of life. Thank you. I'd like to thank John Armstrong very much for a fascinating lecture this evening. I think that there was an awful lot to think about from his words tonight. Uh, would anybody have any uh, questions that uh, they would like to ask John? Everyone's completely convinced. <laughs> oh, it's so crazy. It's so crazy. You don't know how to. You convince people. One thing. You've raised a number of issues. Can we just wait until the microphone comes around for recording purposes? Thank you. You've raised a number of issues. My question is well, where do we go from the path that you've taken us along this evening so that we may be able to achieve something positive? Right. Um, th th thank you. Um, I, I, I believe that institutions are very, very important. And what, what I have in mind is of adapting the way things like philosophy, history, art history, and so on, the way they function. What, in, in one way of doing it is saying, um, what, do we, what, what is it we would like academics to be good at? Well, one of the things we might want them to be good at is um, taking their ideas into people's lives, answering, responding to, guiding people in, uh, in, 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 in serious and difficult issues. So that's, that's about adapting the, almost like the job description. So you say, let's rewrite, let's rewrite the job descriptions. That's fine. We're not asking people to be stupid. We're asking them to be very intelligent, but about slightly different things. Let's um, have a slightly different system of promotion so that we're in 
encouraging expertise and, 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 and ability um, in uh, n not, not so much in specific research areas as in uh, qualities of mind that are valuable. I'd like to see changes in the way in which PhDs are uh, organized. A PhD started out uh, actually surprisingly recently um, as a, a kind of guild membership for an academic job. So the idea was basically you do a PhD and then you just go and work in a university. Now, that may be, uh, the, there may be some uh, 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 justification for that um, outside of the humanities, because you must remember the humanities is just quite a small area within universities. Um, but in the humanities, that is absolutely not the case. Many people do PhDs um, who will never, ever get academic jobs. And many people who are very good will never get academic jobs. The idea is, is, is that you have to write 80,000 words and it has to be a, a, a kind of submission of will to the existing structure and so on. Um, it seems to me that is not a good way of developing really sophisticated and serious intellectual qualities that the world very much needs. So when someone comes, I mean, it's this terrible, terrible fact that people come out of their PhDs less able to function in the world than they were when they went in. Now, now that, that shouldn't be the case. Three years of, of, of serious maturation of your mind under intelligent guidance should make you vastly more able to function in the world. But it's because we've set up slightly the wrong target. Um, so I think there's an important area of reform there. Um, I think that when that the idea of research also needs to be looked at. The notion of research has come uh, into the humanities to some extent uh, through the natural sciences. And it's based on the idea that the pursuit of the truth is incredibly um, I say, uh, small scale and incremental and also say, guaranteed to produce results eventually. It doesn't need to be understood by the wider world. There's a, there's a poignant phrase from um, Sir Gustav Nossel, who was lamenting the fact, who's a very eminent um, uh, immunologist, who was uh, uh, lamenting the fact that his, his family didn't understand his work. But of course, that doesn't matter for the merit of his work, because you don't need to understand how the drug works for it to cure you. But in the humanities, you do need to participate. But I think the notion of research kind of forgot that. And it, it, it lived with a, a natural sciences idea that so long as someone knows, that's going to be fine. And, that, that's, and to my mind, that's not fine. It, it's on the, we, need, we need to take with the same kind of seriousness the task of how do you get more people to share this? How do you get more people to see that, you know, Milton might be boring, but he's very, very intelligent? How do you get people to, to recognize that kind of intelligence? That these are, these are very, very um, serious questions for a society, and we need to throw our efforts at them. So, so those, are, those are some of the, some of the things... Um, that I would, I would like to see actually happen. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, thank you, John. Um, a while ago I read a book by a character called Lewis Mumford. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've heard of him, who was a, mm -hmm. a well-known urbanist and architect and to some extent humanities scholar of the, uh, the 20th century. He wrote a book called Technics and Civilization, and it's a fascinating book on the history of uh, technology and society um, up until about the mid-20th century. Uh, and about three-quarters of the book was about technical innovation and, and inventions and all those sort of things, technics. But then about the last quarter of the book was all about art and the relationship between art and technical innovation 
and this was he wrote this book in the in the mid 20th century when uh, uh, modernity was in full swing. We were seeing aeroplanes and trains and nuclear weaponry and all those kind of things uh, being developed. Um, but at the same time, we we're seeing it hugely important debates about art and its relationship to modernity and the significance of science relative to art and the role of uh, science and art in pushing society forwards. And, and these days of post-modernity, we've perhaps lost that uh, expectation that art is on a... Or humanities, to generalise it more broadly, is on a similar trajectory to technical innovation in society. So I thought I might... It's a bit of a long introduction to a question, but I thought I might ask you perhaps to reflect, given that in your talk you, you mentioned the business side of things and the role of the, the relationship between the humanities and, uh, uh, and business activity and instrumentality, perhaps I'd invite you to reflect a little on the relationship between art and science yeah. and where that perhaps detachment has occurred and uh, and what we might do about it. Yeah. Um, uh, look, I'd, 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 I'd like to talk about this for a long time, but um, look, it's, it, I, it, I think it, it, to me it's a very exciting issue. Can I uh, suggest almost a parable as a way of framing the issue? Um, look, for a very, very long time in early human history, lots of things were extraordinarily difficult for us to, for people to do. One of the things was it was difficult to get sweet things to eat. Um, the sweetest thing was a banana, and uh, you know, or, or, or an apple or something like that. Then technology makes it terribly, terribly easy. And one of the cheapest things in our society is sweetness. The price of sweetness goes right down. So then, instead of all our, our kind of efforts being how do we get sweet things? Our task then becomes, how do, we, uh, how do we regulate ourselves in relation to this thing which is now very easy for us to do, but not always very good for us to do? This is, this is, this is uh, really what I think has happened in relation to technology in a very generalized way, which is that technology makes certain kinds of activities very, very easy, but in making them easy actually raises, should raise the question, why do we want those things? Why are they good to do? it actually makes the need for values and hierarchy much hierarchy in the sense of you have to prioritize. You have to say one thing's more important than another. Um, and that's a really difficult thing to do. Um, makes it much, much more important. Now, weirdly, our society also gave up on institutions of hierarchy at the same time. So... Postmodernity came along and said, "Do you know? Weirdly, um, whatever you want, um, that's just fine." And you know, and that was sort of like the idea was, oh, "This is clever," but that's what the world is offering us anyway. You know, that's what that, there is nothing dumber than the idea that somehow it took. You know, it was the intellectuals who were leading that. You know, that's what. Um, you know, that's what Walmart had already realised. It didn't take. You know, it didn't take the blokes at Yale to work it out. They were catching up. It's, in fact, the task was completely different. The task for intellectual leadership was not to just not to say, oh, do you know, weirdly, nothing is better than anything else, you know, which was fighting against the Victorians a very urgent battle, one might feel. Um, it was, in fact, the urgent task was to decide in a world where you can quite cheaply get a lot of things, what is it good to want? And, above all, to speak to major decision makers and agents within that world. That is, you know, the bourgeois businessman, uh, the middle-class family, the, 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 the voter who's in the centre of politics. These are the major constituencies of our society. Now, to, to hold on to the technology thing, which I'm miles away from, I think that we've, we're facing a kind of double problem, which is technology is very strong, incredibly strong, and incredibly effective and cheap. And the arts are mostly fighting utterly the wrong battles and unpopular 
and subsidized and they're just utterly unengaged. If I could put, if I could put it at its saddest, There's a mantra that is always there. The arts will make you think. What's so good about that exhibition? Oh, made me think. That's the lowest ambition. <laughs> think anything. But why is that said? It's because we won't, it's because the writer won't say what they believe good thinking is. So they trick themselves and they say, oh, it's thinking. Oh, any sort of thinking. But that's but that's precisely running away from exactly the issue. Now, mostly, if you look at, I'm afraid, I mean, I'm, I, I, I think that if one, that the reason one can't ask the real question is because the arts would be humiliated. That if you said, what does this person make you think? What do, the, do they teach you to think well? Do they make your thinking more accurate? Do they make you more logical? Do they give you better evidence? The answer would be no, absolutely not. They give you... Um, surprising thoughts which turn out to be very ordinary and which you could have had on your own. Making, they are no, I am afraid, I am afraid. Look, this is very bad news for the art world, but, but the visual arts in particular, I think, are just, are just, I mean, they're perfectly nice as decoration and nice things to have at home, but in terms of a big cultural force in the world, they are absolutely nowhere. So the classic task whereby the arts might be the vehicle of cultural dignity and seriousness that would have the, in sense, the authority and the reach to hold our technical abilities and guide them and give them good purpose, the, I'm afraid that we have totally wasted that one. And, and this is why I think the renewal of the humanities is such an urgent task. And, and that's why I was trying to tell you this history about why the humanities and, and to some extent the arts are still in a kind of trapped mentality in which they think the task is to fight their parents. Whereas the task is to be the parent and to say, no, this is better than that. It is... It is it, in 1952, it might have been exciting to say, let's, throw, you know, let's try and be modern. But we're very, that's so easy now. That's not where the issues are. So I think that um, it's, 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 the power, it's the absolutely unstoppable power of technology that requires that any people who care about values, who care about the arts and the humanities, need to... Take, need, need a radically different model of those tasks. And that involves some very painful moves. And this is what I fear we won't be able to face up to. I've used the word hierarchy. That's such anathema. But it is the word we need. A notion like dignity. Who's going to stand up for that? One thing is better than another. Who's to say? Well, we're to say. Well, I, you know, we have to. But a society could die of politeness. It could die of shyness. And we, we won't, I mean, we won't die economically. Of course not. But we might die in other ways. I'm, I'm an academic, uh, and um, I am encouraged by your uh, excitement about reform. But there are a couple of issues that, um, I, that bother me a bit. First of all, I think that your urge for reform is to some extent pointed in a particular direction, which, is, which has an agenda. And I think that is potentially quite dangerous because um, a, a reform that replaces something um, with something else exclusively or tending towards that can actually 
produce the same kind of problems again. Okay, so, so I think that, uh, I mean, I would very much favor diversity and competition and um, the changing of systems so that they can accommodate enormous variety. And the second part of my concern is that I am not aware of any repressive regimes that have not actually been a godsend for some parts of the humanities. Um, oh, that, that must be, yeah, I mean, that, 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 that must be true, um, oh, that, that last point. Um, but, but look, let me... Can I ask you to be more explicit about the agenda problem? Um, I, look, when, when you... Look, I... I when you talked about what academics do, which is write papers and all that, I absolutely agree with you. They, they write papers that are read by very few people. There are, some, there are systems in place that actually evaluate all that stuff, which is a kind of fake economics uh, model. I think that, that, that the humanities would be enriched if that continued, but something else was added, so that there were several different pathways that could then... Um, exist or coexist, and some of them would wither away and others would rise. As soon as you have some very pointed fix, you are going to create a situation which will get co-opted and taken over and it'll go into the wrong hands. Yeah, look, and that's, that's really fascinating. I mean, one, of, one of the things that's very much on my mind is that... Um, and says, I'm standing here talking about it. I, I don't hold the levers in my hands. And therefore, um, you know, part of my, 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 my sense of what I'm doing is to, it, it, is to advocate, advocate a, a set of issues which will enter into a practical situation which has many, many other things going on in it. So in a, in a sense, I want to be, uh, I'm trying to be a voice for a particular point of view, um, which I very much believe in, um, but my attitude towards it would be different if, if you know, if someone says, is that, 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 you know, if someone says, okay, right, so now you can change it. One would then want to take other things into consideration, absolutely. Um, what is that phrase? You you campaign in poetry and govern in prose. Well, I may never get to govern, but um, and that's a different issue. So this is something of the, the poetry of it. But there is a, there is another thing. Um, if I if I can come back to you on the word on the word variety and diversity, um, I mean these are these are obviously words that, it, that 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 carry very very positive resonance in our society, um, but, but it's not, but they're slightly misleading because it's not pure variety that one wants or pure diversity. You know, when I lived in Finchley, the Finchley Axe murderer added variety and diversity to our society, but nobody thinks, well, that's great. You know, but I mean, that's a very extreme example. But what, what I mean is that, is that, is that, Actually, we want, a, we want a number of good things going on at the same time, and the word, vari words variety and diversity are sort of indicators in that direction, but not asking the hard question, which is, well, what are the good ones that we want? Uh, look, if you... Um... <coughs> I, I, I'll digress a little. I mean, one Please. of the most exciting times of my life was when I was an undergraduate at Cambridge, and I saw uh, Levis collapse and Steiner come up. Oh, yes, yes. Right? And, and it took, uh, the execution took about two weeks. Yep, yep, and yep. Buildings were occupied, all that kind of thing. Now, one thing that was not very. Um, no, no, this is fantastic. Not, this is not, so good. No, so good. So, so, something that was not tremendously exciting and f followed by lots of people collapsed, and something equally not exciting, uh, <laughs> replaced it. Uh, and, that, and that was, uh, was I believe, largely because diversity was not respected. Right. And, and institutions are, are capable of um, going sclerotic on, on, you know, they, they go for a paradigm that sorts things out 
in the short term that is bound to die because of its atrophy. Yeah. Um, look, uh, th th this is uh, it, the the. Um The influence of Levis in Cambridge being replaced by, um, by, by George Steiner. But um, what is the lesson one should learn? I think, in a way, I, I look with a certain kind of longing on both those figures. So although they disagreed, I mean, they had a very different um, way of thinking about the world. And, they, they, and, and this is, this is um, a thing that deserves a lot of consideration. Um, they had very deep disagreement, but what they shared was an intense longing to bring it to other people. Now, as has been pointed out, um, they lived, in a sense, in a very um, in a small world. That is, their idea of, cha of, 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 of influence was a few hundred people in and around the same university. Now, in those days, that wasn't such an inaccurate assessment because they didn't live in a cultural democracy. We do. So, so they lived in a cultural oligarchy, which meant was that... Sorry? Ah. Um, well, what I mean by a cultural democracy is that um, the... Uh, if I could put it this way. It's not acknowledged by elites. But, what act, but, but there's, there's, there's very, very little, as it were, um, sense of... of uh, of, of deference, which is what you would get if you had a, a, a strong oligarchy. So, so people who read Dan Brown don't think, "Oh God, I have to be, I have to be ashamed of that because he's, you know, a fiftieth of the quality of George Eliot." I mean, it just doesn't happen. I mean, maybe you've got one or two people who feel that, but by and large, the just is that we just don't live in a society in which people think, "Well, I really must, um, you know, hide my." Uh, shameful preferences and try to uh, acquire the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the the tastes of, of, of the elite, um, which is which is when an elite is powerful, um, and and that that has that has long gone, I think. But look, what what I what I want to take from these characters is is what is a really fine disagreement. And that is a disagreement where you, you can you believe in both sides. The most valuable disagreements to us are ones where you in a sense you love both parties. And I think that the the deepest root of that is, is very intimate. Um, certainly for me it it, it, it it's to do with my parents uh, who would often have terrible disagreements, not clever disagreements, just hostile, bitter, mean. And I love both of them. And I could see that what was in val value in each was not being transmitted between the two. But there was no doubt that there was tremendous worth there. And so the immense longing grew up to, to, to capture that misunderstood goodness, as it were, to say to my mother, I know he did all this stuff, but look what he really meant was, or to say to my father, but you know that's not really what she was getting at. She's trying to tell you something. You know, That's trying to capture the, the goodness that's there that, that gets missed in the, in, the, in, in the rough engagements of, of, of life. So I'm, uh, I'm trying to picture a plurality that involves serious evaluation. There, are good, there, there, are, there is more than one good, but that doesn't mean that anything is the same as anything else. And that's, that's one of the if you could sort of boil it down, I think that is one of the hardest things for our society to work with at the moment, which is the good is plural, as there is more than one way, but that doesn't mean that everything's the same. 
Now, that's a mantra, but how do... Going, taking that back into the humanities, it means I'm not looking for agreement, but of genuine disagreement. There's disagreement about views of life, disagreement about what's genuinely important. My disagreement with many of the art historians is not a serious disagreement. They just don't have any view on why this is a good painting or not. So we just, not, we just don't disagree. Right? They just avoid the question and I try to answer it. What I'm looking for is genuine disagreement about those real things. The disagreement about when a painting was painted or who said what about it is on a totally different level. Disagreement about, you know, did Schopenhauer say this or that is totally different from should one be pessimistic about life? That's a real question. And of course there should be disagreement. But it's disagreement about those things. If one could put it, it's the quality of disagreement. So in a way, I love the idea of Steiner and Levis disagreeing. But I'm sad that it was just, in a sense, it was contained just within such a small audience. What we want are, are the, the, in, in a sense, the, the, those arguments to be, to be broader. Thanks. Um, I'm a, a nominally a criminal from Griffith Business School. Um, I wondered whether actually the, the title there could be What Are Academics Worth as a, an academic <laughs> rather than huma humanities. Oh, that's a good question. I agree with you in your analysis of how we get our brownie points. But it, my question to you was about communication, actually, and when you said that book sales, published paper book sales aren't going too well at the moment. I've just the, I'm the proud possessor of a new iPad. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder whether this is going to make um, Wordsworth more accessible to more people. And I wanted to link that to what's going on in the Middle East at the moment with uh, millions of people using new communications technology. Yeah. Um, uh, and they're being very passionate about things. And um, we were just reflecting on how they'd surrounded in Cairo, they'd surrounded the museum to protect the objects inside it from looters. Mm. That maybe they've just protected the tourist industry, of course, but I don't think so. Um, I think they may have been protecting the humanities. I just yeah. wondered as a commentator what you thought. Oh, look, there, there, there are so many things there. Um, can I start on a slightly odd point, which is um, about uh, reverence for iconic cultural objects. Um, now, this is not, a, not, not particularly to do with uh, um, the, the current um, situation, but it's often the case that, that something is um, highly revered, but one might feel that its real worth isn't being known or understood. Think of, think of the admiration for, or the, the attention that's given to the Mona Lisa in, in, in Paris. Now, this is a very incredibly famous, highly regarded work. But it seems, it seems very odd that, that it should be venerated that way. That is that it's, a, it's like, it's something that is incredibly solemn and perhaps rather sad work. Um, and there's clearly it's people want some, something from it. But, it's, but I would say the quality of relationship is quite low, even though the, um, the esteem in which it's held is very high. Um, that would be something that we could, that again, I think we're, we're very uncomfortable with, um, identifying as a society, but I think it's, it's very normal. Um, and the problem there is not that the object is, um, in, in a sense, just sort of technically misunderstood. It's that it's, dare I say, spiritually misunderstood. It's, it's like, how can I put it? 
the Elgin marbles, those things from the Parthenon, being seen as a national icon. Of course they're national, they belong to, they came from a particular place and so on. But inside what they speak of is... a very noble sense of religious ceremony. Now, I don't know whether that's what people want to go back to Greece or what they want. I mean, it just seems to me it's not that these objects gain an esteem which is separate from their true worth, but that that esteem is a kind of beginning point of love. It's like a baby's idea of love. I know my parents. I want to be close to them, but I don't know them. It's not, it's not that they lack information. The, the, in other words, those devotions are often a starting point for developing a deeper relationship with something. And we've often misdescribed what that relationship is. We think of it in terms of acquiring more information, but that's not what, it, what it's really about. It's about developing in, um, an affinity with the object so that the things that it esteems become more precious to you. That, if, if I can take a, a sidestep to, from that to the the issue of, of, of worth, my initial reaction was, was to hear it very, very economically and to hear almost like how well off are humanities academics. Um, it's a slightly barbaric question, but maybe a significant one. It would be monstrously wrong to judge a person's humanity or moral worth by their economic standing. But what you can get an indication of is how well they're appreciated by their society. Now, if you live in a, if you live in a terrible society, you know, this, is, this was Plato's obsession. Plato thought that good people were doomed to failure in the world because the world was a rotten place. So he thinks um, it's impossible for a good person to succeed in the world. And um, uh, they will always be outgunned and out, uh, outmaneuvered by the rogues and rascals. And uh, that's an accurate translation of his uh, technical terms, of course. Um, but but, 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 but there's, a, there's, a, there's a view that's very, very pessimistic and says there is no way a decent person can compete properly in the world. So one of the things that you can see is what's the kind of standing? Now, in a, gen- in a very general way, um, humanities academics, their standing has kind of gone down, I would say, on average, uh, in 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 the world, and um, and in a quite a crude way, that is a, a an economic standing. That is an indicator of fitting in less well into the economy. Now, one could just live with that, but my view is that that's that's in a way a terrible mistake. It's also very tantalising, which is that. If one could better un- better analyze the, the worth of what is known, it should have a bigger role in the world. This is this is the task that I think uh, that I, that I, that I've really set myself. And I try to address in the in the essay, which is, you know, what are some of the things that the humanities are very good at that are very valuable elsewhere, or the humanities could get better at that are very valuable elsewhere. That's of identifying what is the need in our society that we might be very, very well positioned to meet. Not a crude need, a high need, a noble need. Um, I have wandered so far from your question, but I hope we've got somewhere, somewhere strange. We might need to finish up there. I'd like to thank you, John, very much for, for sharing so generously with us tonight your thoughts. Uh, I have found it very fascinating. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. If anybody would like to read John's essay in full, please consider a subscription to Griffith Review. There are some brochures on the seats that will uh, lead you to how to gain a subscription or the, the you can purchase 
Griffith Review also uh, and, and read more on this topic. So thank you once again, John, for sharing your time with us this evening. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.